in the name of Jesus, our King of kings and our Lord of lords. This, the year is 1863, and Union troops have lined the road leading to the beach in Charleston, South Carolina. They cheer, and they salute their comrades. They are the black soldiers of the 54th Infantry Division of Massachusetts. Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation has allowed these African-American men to serve in the armed forces of the United States of America. These were well-disciplined and very experienced soldiers who were on their way to attack a Confederate fort. Like many other battles in the Civil War, this one means certain death. And so these soldiers knew full well, as did the crowds by the side of the road, that no matter how bravely and strongly that they would fight, most of them would die. Most of them would not survive. Even so, a fife and drum strike up a military tune as the battle flags of the Union Army snap and flutter in the sea breeze. This brief moment of glory shines with disciplined courage, the courage that these men had to die for their families, to die for their children's freedom. And this story, this story which tells of sacrifice with its brief moment of glory reminds us of Palm Sunday. This is a time when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, shouting praises, the people in the crowd spread their outer garments along the road for Jesus to ride on. And Jesus himself knew well in advance that he would face death as he went forward. Jesus was the one-man army of God passing in review. He was both general and soldier. He was both king and he was slave. He carried no gun or sword. His weapons were courage and obedience and love, and his uniform was humility. This was his glory. And so the king was coming, but he had no chariot. No chariot or even a sturdy cavalry horse, only a humble beast of burden. Even this colt or donkey was borrowed because Jesus did not own anything. The colt on which Jesus rode is remembered as a fulfillment of prophecy and a sign of humility. In Bible times, it was very much a custom of the people that everyday citizens yearn for the glory days of King David. King David was a superhero to them. During David's reign, there was prosperity, there was peace, there was freedom. But these kinds of blessings had not been seen by the people for thousands of years. They had been captive to the Roman citizens. If anyone could return Israel to those days, it was this man, this man Jesus who came from the lineage of King David. It was King Jesus who could save them, they thought. He was known for his miracles. He had raised Lazarus from the dead. He had to be the real thing. He had to be God's king. So when the word spread quickly that Jesus of Nazareth was going to come to Jerusalem, it didn't take long before the crowds uh, gathered together. No advanced planning was necessary at all because everyone wanted to see Jesus in this parade. Everyone wanted to be there. In addition to their outer garments, they would cut down branches from the palm trees similar to the kind of branches that some of us were carrying this morning. It was a tradition, a tradition for the people as a way to greet a king when the king would come to their city. They would sing and they would chant, chant in unison along the way, and the children would be leading the way. And they would say, would you say it with me? Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. It would be a humble welcome because they were humble people. But it would be from the heart. And Jesus would know that it was from the heart. He would see their desire for his help and his compassion as they cried out to welcome him as a king. 
But then some of the Pharisees in the crowd were very much upset about what was happening here with Jesus that day and with all the people gathering around him as if he were a king. They were annoyed at the cheering of the people. And to them, Jesus was no king. Jesus was not a hero to them. Teacher, teacher, they demanded, order your disciples to stop saying these things. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these people were silent, the very stones would shout out. And even so, excitement filled the air. Anticipation prevailed. What great timing. It also happened to be the Passover in Jerusalem. And so the streets were busy with people who were preparing for the annual celebration from all parts of the known world to remember God's deliverance from the oppression of the Egyptians long ago. They thought it was about to happen again. We're going to be delivered. Maybe even an end to King Herod, who they did not like. And maybe this Jesus would be crowned as King of Israel. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And yet I wonder. I wonder if in the middle of their praises they even noticed the tears in Jesus' eyes as he approached the city. Luke records for us in his gospel that Jesus wept. On the way to Jerusalem, he could see the city in all of its glory. He stopped. And just as he wept at the grave of Lazarus, he also wept over Jerusalem's spiritual decay and demise. He had wept over these people. And he looked into their eyes and he saw their helplessness. He saw their hurt. He saw their despair. He heard their cries for mercy. They truly looked like sheep who did not have a shepherd. He knew, he knew very well what faced him ahead. He knew the severity of pain and punishment that weighted his body. He came with a very heavy heart, but he came nevertheless. He knew very well what was going to happen. But why? Why did he do it? Why did he come? He did it because he loved the people. This was his mission. This is why he was born. He came to forgive, to become, to come to give new life here and also in heaven. He came to give all of this to all people. And the fact of the matter is that he also loves each one of us here today. He loves you, he loves me, he loves all of us. And he also weeps over us. He knows what's in our hearts and in our minds. He knows that our various acts of worship are not always pure. They can be rather superficial at times. He knows that there are times when we want a God who will wave a magic wand and take away all of our troubles and our pain and our hurt. We often want a God who does as we tell him. Do it this way, Lord. Fix it this way. This is what I want. We want a God who overlooks our sins. But he came to this world anyway. He came to forgive our sins. He came to declare us free from the bondage and the tyranny of Satan. He came to feed us and to care for us. He came to give us forgiveness. He came to give us heaven. He came to receive our worship. And he invites and he encourages us to lift up our hearts and our voices in song and praise him. Here he comes. Our king is coming. And so we worship, not just today, but on the other days throughout this week that we call holy. We will recall the tear-stained eyes of our Lord as he made his way to Jerusalem and to the temple and then to the Garden of Gethsemane, to the upper room to celebrate Holy Communion and to the cross where he died, and then to the grave. And we will weep with him. Our tears will be tears of repentance as we come in remorse and contrition over our sins. But those tears, those tears will be mixed with tears of joy. The joy comes because the journey that began on this Palm Sunday that sees him suffer death by crucifixion on Good Friday ends up with an open tomb and his resurrection from the dead on Easter Sunday. 
And so the tears of sadness over our own sinfulness are changed into joy because Jesus, our King of kings and our Lord of lords, came for us anyway, despite our sin, despite what he sees in our hearts because he loved us so very much. The King came for us and for all people and he's coming again for you, for me. And we will shout with all the people. Say it with me. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.